speaker today is a colleague um, from the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center, Dr. Mitch Eaton. He's a USGS research ecologist with the center whose research focuses on using models to understand habitat dynamics and the spatial and temporal variation of species with an emphasis on evaluating uncertainty and risk to assist decision makers with the information needed to restore and conserve trust responsibilities. His interests include bridging the science management gap by working with stakeholders early in the development of management issues and considering how science can best serve decision making. So now take it away, Mitch. Mitch, I've stopped sharing and now you're able to grab the slides. All right, so let's see. Does that work? Am I sharing? Or oh no, I have to hit this still. Okay. Is that working now? Just to be sure. Right now. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and for hosting this web web forum. I. Uh, it's really nice to be able to reach out to this many people and especially in this uh, in this era where I don't get to see many people. So um, I'm glad you all could make it. Um, I wanted to um, I want to start this talk first by uh, considering the role of public lands um, as we uh, go through the motions and efforts to adapt to global change. I think this is at a, a, an important place to start. Let's see, is this working? There we go. Uh, we know that our public lands provide the basis for conservation of, of critical habitat on which fish, wildlife, and humans all depend. Uh, we also know that our natural areas and public lands provide countless other ecosystem goods and services, including natural protection of human infrastructure as sea levels rise, as storms increase in frequency and strength. Uh, in addition, uh, other ecosystem services, um, such as recreation and, and provisioning services, uh, public lands also um, contribute to culturally relevant materials. Uh, and these are used often in maintaining uh, valued cultural uh, traditions, which help sustain our social and community livelihoods, as well as their resilience. This idea may be most relevant or more relevant now in, in the current global pandemic. Um, I don't know if folks can respond using icons uh, on these Zoom chats, but I, I would ask the question, who on this call has, has, uh, has been to one of our public lands or natural areas during this COVID outbreak to take advantage of open space and get some, some needed respite from the stress of lockdown? Uh, have, how or have public lands factored into your, your own personal adaptations to this, this rare global change event? Um, have they contributed to your own personal resilience or that of your, your family, your neighborhood or community? Um, now I think it's important to think about uh, those communities that might not have access or the means or proximity to access public lands or natural spaces. How might their ability to cope with this pandemic actually be affected? Um, I think this gives us a, a, some, some relevant context and a powerful example in the present day of the functioning of how tightly coupled our social and ecological systems are and really points out the role of, uh, of public lands in adaptation and why conserving them is not just necessarily uh, an environmental concern, but um, is closely linked to how our communities actually function uh, to issues of social justice and how we may or may not be able to adapt uh, as a community to global forces um, that are changing around us. So the challenges we face uh, from these global forces include those that are quite familiar. Um, ecological ones are, are often very apparent. Uh, in coastal systems, um, some of the most apparent uh, impacts are, are sea level rise and flooding to have habitat and, and wildlife with, with loss of rare habitats like this maritime forest. Uh, uh, direct impacts to species um, and erosion of, of our natural buffers. Other long-term challenges we face include how to address uh, impacts to both public and private infrastructure. Um, two examples from North Carolina and South Carolina. Uh, but we can't just ignore the effects of global change on, on, on social resilience and what role these communities 
play or our communities play in adaptation planning. And this includes both wealthy communities like the previous slide, the Isle of Palms in South Carolina, as well as more vulnerable areas, uh, such as these photos from Avondah, South Carolina, and Ile de Jean Charles in, in Louisiana, which is a recent example of, of some, uh, some social impacts. Um, so to succeed in, in adapting our, these social ecological systems, we really need to increase local capacity of these communities to respond to change. And to do so, we as conservation or, or resource managers uh, must reach out beyond our familiar conservation practitioners and partners to communicate and engage with these diverse communities that are often more intricately connected with changing and evolving ecosystems. We must also recognize that global change isn't limited to just ecological change, but also involves evolving global economic, political, and, and social forces. These have equally strong influence on our social ecological systems, leading to shift in, uh, shifts in demographics, um, resulting, for example, in, in rapid coastal growth, um, added infrastructure and hardening of coastlines, as well as the displacement or marginalization of vulnerable communities. So how do we address the, the changes and the challenges such as these depicted here in the, in the juxtaposition of, of these two contexts and images? Um, we've, we've tended to focus on ecological adaptations. Um, these appear to be more common in the literature as well as I think in, practi in practice, but um, I think we need to recognize the role of social adaptation as, as both are, are critical if we're going to uh, be able to evolve into the future. So uh, that providing a bit of a bit of uh, context for the talk, I, I wanted to now lead lead into the actual project. So uh, soon after our establishment, the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center was asked by one of our primary advisory groups, the South Atlantic LCC, to develop a project to investigate the impacts and susceptibility of Atlantic and Caribbean uh, national wildlife refuges to sea level rise. Uh, we ended up funding. Uh, two projects over over a, a course of several years uh, to explore how these to explore these topics and to think about how to assist the refuges with long term planning efforts. So, as an organization such as ours tasked with providing science to natural resource agencies to help guide their adaptation efforts, we started by considering what the challenges of large scale global change actually mean for either of us for the for the science providers and the resource management agencies. Um, some of the immediately the immediate challenges that we started to consider as being relevant for an organization like the National Wildlife Refuge System included the possibility of their being constrained by traditional fairly narrow organizational goals and mandates, which led to questions about whether these goals could be adapted as needed, and if so, who really has the authority to do so. Other questions included what are the major trade-offs faced by the refuges themselves and how much uh, both financial and, and staff capacity do they have to really engage in long-term planning. And then given uncertainties about the future, what are the uh, refuge decision makers' attitudes towards risk and how do they balance uh, more short-term defensive management actions with possibly longer-term uh, uh, actions uh, uh, around retreat or other or, or other uh, adaptive measures that may be um, somewhat more difficult to to uh, get their heads around. Um, does even their enabling legislation allow for such considerations? These are these are questions that we had to start with if we were going to think about this in a in a reasonable way. So all of the cast members that were involved in this project um, are trained in the principles of of decision science which they use in their professional and research uh, agendas to help guide managers with good decision making. And, and, and by this, I simply mean that we tend to structure problems in terms of choices uh, or, or values, choices, and outcomes. And therefore, we tend to approach problems by first carefully framing a decision, uh, which includes eliciting values of a particular decision maker, as well as uh, their involved stakeholders, um, quantifying these values into uh, objectives that we can measure and monitor, um, and identify discrete decision alternatives or the choices a decision maker has to decide amongst. Uh, we then develop uh, some sort of model to predict the outcome of selecting any one of these alternatives, 
uh, expressed in terms relative to those stated objectives. Uh, models are typically tailored to consider appropriate uncertainties, uh, spatial or temporal dynamics, dynamics and, and other aspects. Finally, uh, we perform some sort of optimization that analyzes trade-offs among multiple objectives, considers uh, resource constraints, and considers both short and long-term benefits, um, among other aspects. So at first glance, a planning process like we've, we've been asked to do seems to be fairly textbook for applying some sort of adaptive management, which is a form of decision analysis, as its defining characteristic is really accounting for uh, the temporal dynamics of resources and uncertainty over time when making management decisions. So instead of starting out with a more traditional research-based approach of estimating climate exposure or assessing impacts on habitat, habitats and species, uh, we began by setting out on a, on, a, on a tour of the East Coast from Florida up to Maine to hear directly from refuge managers about their concerns for the future, the challenges they faced, and what information needs they may have. Uh, briefly, we came away with, this, um, with, with these meetings with a much better understanding of a wide diversity of their concerns, which were really uh, more complicated than simple trepidation about sea level rise, which is, which is sort of where we started this, uh, this venture. Uh, the group of managers through another couple of meetings eventually came to, to an agreement that they'd like to address uh, at least start by addressing a simpler decision context focused on a single refuge rather than uh, framing a, an adaptation problem around, say, a portfolio of refuges, for example, at the scale of the flyway, thinking about those sorts of management questions and, and approaches. And this is a very, those, that would be a very different set of contexts, uh, different decision makers and questions than focusing on the decision context of an individual refuge. So this group of managers also decided that they would, uh, they, we would focus on Cape Remain National Wildlife Refuge uh, as a test case with the idea that um, these, these, uh, these managers from across the East Coast would remain involved and benefit from the process and then hope we could expand some of the lessons learned to other refuges or even scale up to think about more of that refuge portfolio problem. Um, so as a brief introduction, uh, Cape Remain protects predominantly marsh habitat on the, on the central coast of, uh, of South Carolina. Um, it includes several barrier islands. Um, it's, it's found uh, between uh, Charleston and Myrtle Beach on the, on the coast of South Carolina. It's um, been given uh, primary wilderness designation um, and is an important stopover site and nesting area for uh, waterfowl, for migrating shorebirds, as well as one of the larger, or the largest northern populations of loggerhead sea turtles, which, uh, which nest there. It also hosts a number of other endangered species. Uh, this refuge is situated at sea level and the, the primary exposure and threat to its ability to carry out its mission, simply put, is rising seas and hurricanes. Uh, this refuge has lost more than 2,100 acres since about 1950. Um, you can see this, the, uh, the sea level rise trends over, uh, over the last uh, about 100 years. It's about four times uh, greater sea level rise than, uh, than the global average. Uh, it has several waterfowl impoundments that are threatened, uh, as are its rare maritime forests, the nesting beaches that I mentioned before, and other uh, critical habitats. Um, however, another global driver that's really threatening the refuge existence is rapid urban growth. Um, this is coming out of the Charleston area and from surrounding counties, which are among the fastest growing in the U.S. Uh, this development is serving to harden much of the coastline and uh, operationally it's cutting off the ability of coastal marsh to migrate or retreat upland as sea levels rise. So after some initial meetings, uh, we brought um, the refuge managers and staff together for a series of scoping workshops, both on and off site of the refuge to continue with this problem framing. Um, we wanted to define their objectives, specifying short and long-term activities or actions that might be available to meet those objectives that the refuge identified. Uh, these workshops really highlighted two dominant themes. One was the difficulty of capturing these values and converting them into objectives, which ranged from fairly obvious uh, objectives that originated from the refuges enabling legislation, such as providing waterfowl habitat, to more 
difficult and nuanced objectives such as how do we capture the existence value of sea turtles and what does that mean for future management. The other, the other theme that dominated these workshops included questions of scale and scale mismatch between the refuge objectives and the decision context or what they had available to actually do to respond. Um, so while near-term decisions such as managing uh, or maintaining waterfowl impoundments, um, these were considered, the longer term strategies that the refuge uh, believed was uh, within their purview revolved around acquiring new habitat to replace those lands or that those, those habitats lost to sea level rise. But in decision making, uh, these management objectives and the, and the set of available alternatives or the decision context that a manager has uh, available to them need to be combat compatible. Uh, scale mismatch becomes really apparent when the scale of the problem is not matched by the decision maker's ability to address it. That seems fairly straightforward, but is often not uh, uh, acknowledged very well. So for example, the long-term strategy of land acquisition for, the, for Cape Remain is largely out of the control of the immediate refuge manager. Uh, this is due to the fact that their, uh, their expansion plan is limited by legislation. It's limited by the high cost of land in the surrounding area, as well as uh, funding allocation decisions made at other, other governance scales, that of the regional or national offices. This, this uh, picture here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the, uh, up here, these are, this is the expansion plan uh, region for the Cape, uh, for, the, for the refuge. Um, so it's, it's quite small relative to the size of the refuge and to the size of the problem. And so um, the small scale of these options available, uh, given the constraints that I just mentioned, um, is really mismatched with the scale of the drivers affecting the resource, which uh, we can depict here are represented in this in this composite image of expected sea level rise at, at three feet, uh, which is in which is in blue, and the urban expansion pressures predicted out to 2050 in red. So in essence, the ability of the managers to choose an action to achieve her objectives uh, is really dwarfed by the scale of these forces. Um, a decision analysis could still identify the best of all available options. In this case, what might be the, the best portfolio of parcels to invest in given those that are available. But really this would be what we, what we, what we attribute to providing a, a good answer to the wrong problem. And this became, uh, as I said, a dominant theme in these workshops. So um, the outcome of identifying this scale mismatch was the realization that the, the refuge's stated mission of providing stopover habitat for uh, migrating waterfowl, providing nesting habitat for uh, threatened shorebirds and turtles, as well as rec recreational and educational opportunities for visitors might not be sustained under the existing management context. The, the options that they have available might not allow these to, to, to continue on. And so to, to address or correct this mismatch, the refuge would either have to retreat from these current objectives and, and match them to what they had available to them or change the decision context expand it in order to have a chance to really meet these desired objectives. So the refuge rec recognizing these, these enormous challenges to their operations and their survival under current practices, therefore they chose to um, uh, explore a more expanded decision context to increase the likelihood of meeting of existing objectives. In this case, this meant expanding the, the broader decision context to include looking beyond the refuge uh, their, the refuge boundaries to, to think about conservation and land protection, uh, as well as added resilience to these global change processes across the wider low country landscape. Um, this would require uh, bringing into the process uh, additional stakeholders and decision makers with broader powers to, to act, to make, to make decisions, um, as well as addressing a wider set of fundamental values that are associated with those decision makers, including uh, potentially competing interests in, in say, production forests or uh, thinking about urban planning issues, uh, tourism more broadly in the region, uh, thinking about uh, uh, commercial exploitation of natural resources like fisheries. Um, this, this meant that the refuge might have to adapt 
change or expand uh, long held mission objectives. And, and, and as I mentioned before, we're not sure if the legislating authority or the, the governance structure of the refuge system would allow that. So um, this, this expanded decision context makes, makes adaptation planning a lot more complicated. And most notably in that multiple decision makers would have to come together and act collaboratively to sustain this broader, more diverse set of values from this wider, wider community and not just think about the, the objectives of the refuge in their traditional sense. The participants that we eventually brought together understood, oops, I'm sorry, uh, uh, understood that, um, uh, that we would have to, um, instead of focusing on on direct planning actions or activities, thinking about change that we might do better or must do better to facilitate a process uh, or uh, a, a, a program of how do we uh, how do we bring this change about? How do we bring around these decision makers to to start thinking about how they can uh, engage collaboratively um, to uh, to make these decisions well into the future? So, from our perspective, uh, more than simply providing uh, new models or more information as, as we typically do um, in our agency. Our thoughts really evolved to believe that creating and testing a more uh, 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 an engagement process to build effective collaborations would be more sustainable and give the refuge, the, the project cooperators and other decision makers um, greater capacity to learn together uh, into the future and be able to reach uh, more uh, collective or group understanding of appropriate adaptation strategies to face these futures. So in short, uh, these meetings and these workshops revealed uh, a, a more complicated uh, set of management objectives that are uh, likely scaled hierarchically from both local to regional as well as short term to long term. Um, that for many objectives, the um, arsenal of available actions uh, available to the refuge are probably insufficient to meet uh, resource goals as stated. Um, the, out, the outcome of these uh, insights was the reframing of our adaptation planning problem to include a more uh, uh, complicated, broader decision context that necessitated coordination and collaboration with other decision makers, likely from within uh, the conservation community, um, as well as uh, with other interest groups. Um, this reframing of our approach from a science product focus to developing more of a process to bring about this diverse community um, was, was, uh, was believed to uh, support the idea of, of being able to reach shared understanding uh, uh, of the range of perspectives across these, uh, these, this community, thinking about the organizational issues, uh, missions and the and possibly institutional constraints that these uh, that this group of decision makers might face. Um, we wanted to evaluate whether it was possible to scale up individual organizational objectives to align with those values shared by a larger set of, consti of con constituents in the region and to be able to uh, collectively uh, consider future uncertainties, threats and opportunities when seeking uh, adaptation strategies that would make sense and that were matched with the scale of the problem. Uh, the additional complexity of this problem framing was also uh, or also revealed that while conventional decision analytic approaches, like I mentioned before, uh, were useful in getting us to this point, um, maybe useful in engaging with partners and addressing some or many of the elements of this project, they might not be sufficient for this collective decision making with great uncertainty, a large number of competing values, um, from multiple decision makers and when uh, control is out of uh, for making a decision is out of the hands of any single institution or individual. Uh, we believe that um, exclusively producing science products to fill knowledge gaps um, was also going to be uh, insufficient. Therefore, uh, we began a search through the uh, both the published and great literature for alternative and complementary methods that we could use to traditional uh, decision analytic methods like adaptive management, uh, multi-criteria decision analysis, and, and various optimization approaches, which we could use uh, and test for promoting this 
this expanded engagement, this collective learning process, as well as thinking about um, applying these for, for actually uh, proactive planning for the future. So we decided to explore several additional methods, including scenario planning, um, a strategic situational management evaluation approach, using some behavior theory, as well as tools uh, borrowed from economics to evaluate the influence of risk uh, and risk preferences on decision making. So I'll describe a little bit of how this, this second phase uh, came about. Um, we first uh, conceived of a model to guide our use of these new methods. Um, this model would, would be integrating both scientific assessment that we would do with partnership engagement using uh, consideration of, of plausible future scenarios to bring those together. Uh, the drivers, um, outputs, and evaluations would be assessed through a lens of community values which we felt um, being expressed in the currency of ecological goods and services would make most sense, um, and how these are expected to be uh, influenced or impacted under these different scenarios. Uh, these, these plausible impacts to those goods and services uh, would capture relevant trade-offs among these various interest groups and help develop this shared understanding of how any given adaptation strategy might promote or reduce the production and delivery of these of these certain services. So this is sort of our, our new uh, modeling framework. We decided to initiate this um, collaboration approaching somewhat like-minded conservation and community organizations working in the Lowcountry region uh, with the idea that we would then use the lessons learned here to expand the process to include more divergent stakeholder groups. Um, uh, that would come with experience. So based on recommendations from the staff of Cape Remain and, and, and some others, um, we began to contact organizations which might be interested in, in joining this partnership. Um, we began by holding individual meetings with this, this, uh, this list of organizations um, to explain our goals and intents, uh, to gauge their interests and invite them to join in this uh, conservation partnership. We began with these partners by conducting a, a, a stakeholder assessment for the region. Um, this was done to identify specific interest groups, um, their relative interest levels in these, uh, these issues and topics, as well as their willingness to engage. Uh, we also considered uh, differences in their real and perceived powers to influence decisions in this region and therefore uh, help guide their future. Um, we applied some considerations from behavior change theory uh, from social science, uh, believing that different strategies of communication and engagement would be needed to reach and involve such groups. And this is the reason why we, we categorize them as such along these axes. Based on the partner's perceptions of uh, these stakeholder groups and their values, we then identified a fairly comprehensive list of those ecosystem goods and services believed to be valued uh, broadly across the low country. This is, uh, became our, our sort of frame of reference in terms of those objectives. Then we engaged in a process of scenario planning, which um, has been used since I believe since about the 1960s to cope with uh, with an uncertain future when exploring uh, organizational strategies for for development uh, and for decision making. It's a useful method to incorporate diverse interests, knowledge and and benefits um, into into a collective learning process. Uh, it's also been used um, to help communicate complex ideas and interactions. Uh, in a more tangible way to a, to a broad audience, which is what we thought would be needed. Um, participants uh, used what we call steep indicators to identify important drivers of those uh, identified ecosystem goods and services. The, these drivers include the influences of social, technological, environmental, economic, and political factors on the things that we care about. These drivers were then prioritized in terms of their perceived impact on the, on the services in the low country and how much uncertainty they might contribute um, when thinking about future conditions. So these perceived uh, critical and uncertain drivers of the future um, included, as expected, uh, global climate change, but also somewhat unexpectedly, 
a uh, strong emphasis on, on global and national shifts in social and political conditions, as well as uh, also somewhat unexpectedly, uh, the influence of the structure and, um, and dynamics of local power uh, and, uh, and agency within the community. Um, these were used, these, these, these three primary axes were used to develop a small number of plausible futures in which um, aspects of, uh, along these axes varied, varied by degree. Uh, these were described in narrative form, uh, including uh, fairly specific influences on both humans, wildlife, as well as social networks and those ecosystem goods and services. This is just an example of, of one and how we uh, how we uh, constructed these um, these scenarios. Uh, we then, uh, through another workshop, um, worked through uh, what's called a SWOT strategic analysis. Um, these uh, the drivers of change that I mentioned, as well as those individual scenarios forming the basis of this analysis, which stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Uh, we used uh, as an exercise. Um, to evaluate uh, uh, both internal strength and strengths and weaknesses of the individual organizations in the partnership, as well as the partnership as a whole, uh, considering their resources, um, their specializations and limitations, uh, as well as overlaps um, uh, between or among uh, individual organizations. Then uh, conditional on each of the scenarios that we developed, uh, we examined the external opportunities and threats, um, identifying which were uh, which were most important and, and likely to occur given those scenarios. These again focused on those steep drivers as well as the, uh, the identified ecosystem goods and services I mentioned previously. Uh, the participants prioritized and weighted the most important factors within each of these four categories uh, which we then used to combine pairwise to reveal elements of varied strategies that leveraged uh, strengths and opportunities, as well as address concerns related to uh, partnership weaknesses as and anticipated threats. And I'll give an example here. Uh, so this is um, a pairwise SWOT matrix for one of our scenarios where uh, we would look at the pairwise intersection of, of uh, the internal characteristics of, uh, of the organizations and the partnerships as a whole um, and evaluate them relative to the identified opportunities and threats. So for example, uh, capable staff uh, may, uh, might be able to leverage the local affinity for, uh, for nesting sea turtles in order to push for regulations on coastal development or, uh, or uh, institute light pollution control measures during certain times of the year. Um, other organizations may have um, better technical or political influence and may be able to push for smart growth planning uh, uh, in response to uh, threats of sea level rise and coastal, uh, coastal development or hardening. Uh, some of the weaknesses um, include financial vulnerability, which might be addressed by developing additional partnership uh, uh, or network organizations that may appeal to, to local government uh, for support as well as help minimizing funding gaps. And finally, um, in, this, in this corner, recognizing the, um, the, the inability to confront any particular threat uh, might allow uh, the partnership or organizations to make triage decisions to avoid uh, costly mistakes. We might call this a, a graceful exit. They might also use this uh, realization to take steps to overcome uh, a particular weakness with developing new ideas or uh, even uh, developing uh, or taking advantage of, of training opportunities. Uh, so with, with participants weighing each of these uh, factor elements, we were able to develop uh, uh, using sort of a decision analysis approach, develop a, an importance ranking of the resulting pairwise combinations which helped identify and potentially prioritize possible strategies uh, for future partnership consideration, taking advantage each of these, uh, these in internal and external factors. Uh, so uh, that, that was fa a fairly brief uh, uh, description of uh, a number of the engagement activities that we, uh, that we embarked on in order to, to test these ideas and give the partners a, uh, 
uh, a sense of the types of communication and engagement tools they might use going into the future, but we didn't limit ourselves exclusively to these engagements. Uh, we, in parallel, um, used this reframed problem context as well as the stated objectives to develop additional science outputs, which included uh, looking at sort of uh, looking at economic uh, predictions of coastal uh, coastal flooding and the, their effect on the housing market and coastal development, as uh, with the idea that um, that the local authorities may be able to incentivize a smarter growth as a function of uh, predicted flood impacts in the future. Um, we also uh, developed a new model to help with conservation reserve design planning for addressing habitat and ecosystem services uh, lost in the broader low country landscape. Uh, and this is an example of the framework that we used here, um, which, uh, which captures the idea that uh, future climate, uh, including sea level rise and habitat composition, um, are, are, uh, are largely unknown in the future in terms of what the uh, the outcomes to uh, to habitat conditions in the region will be, and so uh, with a with a strategy of acquiring new lands, there uh, uh, this comes with considerable risk because of this uncertainty. We borrowed, therefore, from some economic theory to evaluate uh, any combination of land parcels uh, in much the same way as we would a financial investment portfolio, where greater expected payoffs on this axis. Uh, on the y-axis are expected uh, to be um, accompanied by higher risk due to increased volatility and the correlation, correlation between uh, pairs of assets. And so like a financial manager, we can elicit from conservation investors in this case uh, for their tolerance uh, uh, for the risks of climate change and help to determine a reserve design strategy that accounts for these trade-offs while ensuring that we can uh, that we can optimize benefits uh, for a given level of risk, uh, or we can minimize risk uh, for any desired level of conservation return, and so the range of optimal portfolios uh, as a function of this a function of risk are found along this curve, which is which is termed the Pareto or efficient frontier. Uh, for example, this is an, uh, an example of uh, two optimal reserve designs in the Low Country region, uh, with uh, the refuge outlined in red here, uh, which included recommendations for both acquisitions and retention or divestment of existing protected parcels, uh, with the the difference between the two based only on the risk tolerance of the decision maker. What we can do, given their the, the likelihood that multiple decision makers are involved in this uh, in this region um, in terms of conservation planning uh, is use this type of analysis to identify parcel acquisition and investment recommendations that are robust over the spectrum of risk per, uh, perception or tolerance. Uh, I think, uh, yes, we're coming up on, on about 40 minutes, so I'm going to wrap this up with a few lessons um, to take home, or that we've taken home from this, uh, from this exercise. Uh, one is that uh, a values-based approach that we've taken allows us to focus on what and whose values we're trying to achieve, rather than assuming these are known from the outset, and, and as, as done uh, fairly typically uh, leap right into assessment and uh, thinking about strategies. Uh, another take home is that careful problem framing can reveal whether the scale of management objectives match that of the decision maker's ability to take action, uh, with scale mismatch being fairly common and the ability to adjust uh, one or the other uh, in, uh, objectives or context can really um, help avoiding addressing the wrong problem. Complicated or wicked problems, as we often face, um, are going to require new modes of thinking, um, sometimes needing to question existing governance structures and perceived limitations. For example, we had to overcome uh, organizational constraints to consider expanding the problem faced by the refuge, uh, as well as consider additional objectives beyond those traditionally uh, uh, considered by the refuge system. Um, it's essential to recognize that social and ecological systems do not evolve 
or function independently and that addressing the issues of one must necessarily include consideration of the other. Uh, we were surprised in this, uh, in this example by the strong influence of culture, politics, and power differentials uh, in the perspectives of the participants of this, uh, of this partnership, um, even those that were coming from national level organizations and agencies. Uh, although uh, issues of scale, including national politics, globalization, uh, governance concerns um, were, uh, were front and center in the workshop discussions, uh, it also became very clear that a sense of a place, this, uh, 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 an affinity of place, the role of culture, and um, considerations of, of individual agency were ultimately seen as the source for adaptation solutions, so at a, at a much uh, more local level. As such, we found that deliberate steps to reach out, understand, and engage with local stakeholders, um, having diverse perspectives, may be the most effective ways to build networks, strengthen social resilience, and foster group learning uh, in order to act collectively uh, and plan for the future. And finally, I want to end with this, that adaptation in the end is ultimately going to require learning to change behavior. Uh, and characterized in, in management theory, learning uh, from both an individual and an organizational perspective um, has been characterized to be uh, occurring at a, as a multi-level process with each loop in this process uh, occurring uh, stepwise at different times and at different organizational levels. Uh, to bring this, um, to make this a little clearer and bring this back to the perspective of this particular National Wildlife Refuge, uh, we could define their single loop learning as occurring fairly quickly as a function of, uh, of actions they take, um, such as how they might manage waterfowl impoundments in the face of sea level rise. This is where we would see some form of adaptive management occurring at a, at, a, at a much finer scale. Their double loop learning is at a slower, uh, a slower scale or a slower process of, of questioning their assumptions and reframing their objectives. That was exemplified by this project where we had to reframe uh, the problem that we were trying to address. And finally, triple loop learning, the, the slowest, um, maybe at, at a glacial speed, occurs uh, as institutions reconsider their underlying principles and their governance protocols. For example, the National Wildlife Refuge System might be evaluating how it allocates resources across a region as, as these conditions change and as adaptation needs um, become more apparent. They might also uh, uh, begin to question whether their enabling legislation can be updated to reflect these current conditions. Uh, and so this is, I think, um, a, a nice place to end where we think about how, how we as a community, as an individual, as an organization, learn um, and uh, enable our ability to adapt to the future. Uh, so with that, I'd, I'd like to thank um, uh, the partners uh, that were involved in, in, uh, in executing this project over a number of years, as well as the, the conservation partnership members that joined the team. Um, and uh, gave us their attention and their time when they weren't necessarily sure where we were, where we were headed. Um, the project just fairly recently ended, and so we're uh, we're trying to uh, trying to provide um, outcomes in a way that uh, will meet multiple uh, audience needs. Um, this includes a, a large a compendium of all of these activities and outcomes in a in a, a USGS circular publication, which is uh, just about to come out. I can make copies of this available uh, pre-publication for anyone interested. We also have a number of other resources that you can access through the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center website um, or contact me directly for uh, some of the public publications that were um, resulting from this project. And with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention and um, I can hand it over to Hillary or Carrie for moderating what happens next. Great. Thank you, Mitch, for that great talk. Um, we have plenty of time for questions. Maybe not plenty of time, maybe five minutes or so. If you, if you want to ask a question, you can just go ahead and unmute yourself.
by clicking on the microphone button in the bottom left of your screen, or you can type it directly into the chat box and we'll share it for you. Um, in addition, if you're calling in phone only, you can hit star six to unmute your line. So um, does anyone have any questions for Mitch here? Here's a question from Addie. Uh, did the partnership consider reaching out to local DOD installations in the area to see if there was any overlap in their priorities? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. There, there's a lot of effort um, in terms of land management and uh, and thinking about the future in the in the area. There's we worked with a number of um, or at least one uh, land trust. Uh, uh, we did not work with, or we did not reach out to uh, to DOD or other um, larger uh, institutions or agencies at this point. Um, as I mentioned, we were we were starting uh, in sort of an experiential mode with uh, more conservation oriented groups. But the idea in the end was to work with uh, at the county level, um, at the national level, with others with other land management agencies that could. Um, that could affect these uh, this, these planning processes, and so the idea uh, eventually was to reach out to anyone in the region that um, that was interested in 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 this case land acquisition or protection, um, but also uh, further to the point to those folks that might be interested in uh, and tasked with development in the region, so uh, county planner county planners, etc. Gotcha. Thanks for that. Um, any other questions for Mitch? Here's another one in the chat box that I'll go ahead and read um, from Marissa. She was wondering if the present pandemic changes or re reinforces your view of the importance of the process or the outcomes. Um, in other words, do you find the scenario planning process to be dis to be um, robust to the disruption that we're currently experiencing? Well, I think in the uh, that's a good question as well uh, and, uh, and probably a hard one to answer um, of course we didn't when we were doing this several years ago we didn't anticipate something like a global pandemic but i think the fact that the participants were really eager to consider not only uh, ecological changes that were you know maybe more uh, easily captured in terms of their trends but to, to consider the economic the, the vagaries of economic conditions and political processes. So, in, in a broader sense, that that does include uh, the the types of disruptions that this pandemic represents. This it was interesting that this uh, our one of our first um, workshops happened, I think, seven days after the inauguration of our current administration. And so, I I think the the impact of of, of global political and geopolitical shifts was really forefront on their mind. Uh, in the mind of the participants. And so that that really added, I think, a, a unique uh, level of consideration that might not have been as strong um, had it not been, had it not happened when it did. Uh, that said, the low country is a kind of a unique place where this, this sense of, um, of community and, and the history of catastrophes and slow change you know, from the Civil War up to Hur Hurricane Hugo and and uh, and the sort of the development boom um, in the 90s uh, to today really have impressed upon them the role of, of all of these drivers of change. And I think that would include something unexpected like <laughs> like this, um, this global pandemic, although not specifically, of course. That's really interesting. Um, thanks for that answer. I think we have about maybe time for one more before I probably ought to, ought to end it just for time. So anyone want to be bold and charge in with our last question of the morning? All right, uh, from Carrie, we have a, a question. Are there recommendations of specific types of disciplinary expertise that are required for a successful project? Well, the, I think the, the one thing that came out of this that was, uh, again, unexpected for the, the folks that started this project, which were largely ecologists, was uh, 
was the 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 importance of us of social science and and bringing in a social scientist to uh, to to consider the types of engagement uh, activities the type the the form of communication how we how we consider the diversity of perspectives in a way that's that's meaningful tangible and not uh, not overly deconstruct deconstructionist um, much like the diversity we found. Uh, to be important in thinking about adaptation planning in this area moving into the future, I think having that 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 uh, disciplinary diversity in the planning group um, uh, is really needed. And so I, I guess having that a, ra a range of expertise, including social science, as well as um, you know maybe uh, public planning experience, um, would be would be really helpful. Um, I, yeah, that's I, I guess the 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 idea of integrating um, social and natural scientists together is probably um, the the best answer I can offer. Great. Yeah, that makes sense. Very multidisciplinary. Um, okay, well, in that case, I'm going to go ahead and end the questions here. Thank you again, Mitch, for your great talk. Um, I'm going to wrap up just by showing a quick review of our upcoming webinars in this series. We have two left. Um, next month, we'll be hearing from Duane Estes with the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative, as well as Rua Mordecai with the Southeast and South Atlantic Blueprints. They're going to be talking about science needs in Southeastern grasslands with a special focus on Piedmont prairies. That webinar, again, will be held the third Thursday of the month, which is June 18th at 10 a.m. Eastern, also via Zoom. And that registration link is already available. If you want to go ahead and sign up, you can visit the Success Series website, which is at the bottom of this slide, um, or there's a calendar event already up on the South Atlantic LCC website as well. That calendar event is visible from the home page. And you can see we've got a great talk lined up for July as well with Dr. John Cutper. Uh, so we hope that you'll continue to tune in for the rest of our series. So thanks everybody for joining us today. Thanks again, Mitch, um, and to the folks at the Climate Science Center. So.